One of the big reasons we like sports is that it's subject to analysis through the use of stats, facts, details, data, information. But why is it that the same sports people who love facts and data when it comes to analyzing sports, analyzing, for example, their own careers if they're professional athletes, why don't they use that same mind when they apply it to the issue of whether or not the police are mowing down black people just because they're black? Let me give you an example. George Will has written books about baseball. Here's what he said about why he likes it. It rewards adult attention because it's so complex. It's the game both for the participant and the fan that most rewards attention to detail. Mm -hmm. It's the most observable game. You have nine people spread out on a green field. It's episodic. It's not a game of flow like mm -hmm. basketball. Right. So it can be observed and analyzed. You know, these players and coaches, they couldn't function. They couldn't succeed without the use of facts and data applied logically. For example, Jalen Rose was one of the so-called Fab Five, the five starting freshmen of the University of Michigan that years ago went back-to-back -back Final Four appearances? Well, he had a 13-year career as a pro. And one time, somebody suggested that his career was just okay because, after all, he played for three different teams and did not compile a record that some people thought he would based upon his expectations. Jalen Rose very insightfully, skillfully analyzed the criticism using facts and data. Watch. That was a classic I never play high level basketball comment because <laughs> when I played 13 years, my role changed. So okay. when I got drafted by the, hold on, let me finish. When I got drafted by the Nuggets, do you know who still holds the rookie assist record for their team? Jalen Anthony Rose. Okay, when I got traded to Indiana, I was playing point guard. Round 2000, there was like two or three people getting 20 points, six boards, six dimes, five assists. Other two, Kobe Bryant and Jamal Mashburn. We bring back Mark Jackson, I'm on the wing. We got Travis Best, I'm on the wing. I go to the Bulls, I'm getting buckets. Top 10 in the league in scoring then. That's what you call a versatile swing man that played three positions in the league. Holla at Jaylen. your boy. Woke coach Steve Kerr of the NBA Golden State Warriors really, really concerned about racism in America. Watch how he skillfully analyzes a postseason loss. Cleveland uh, brought a lot of force to the game. I thought we had some good shots early that didn't go in. And um, it was like 6 nothing after about four minutes. You know, our defense was pretty good. They had a couple runouts where they got layups, but uh, our half-court defense was good. We just could not get a shot to fall. And, uh, and then they just blitzed us. They, they, as I said, they, they deserved uh, to win the game. They outplayed us, uh, and it was too difficult to come back from 20 down. You know, we made a good push in the second half, but uh, that first quarter was, uh, was, you know, that was a good punch from them. Now, why doesn't Coach Kerr apply that same logic when it comes to this business that the police are mowing down blacks just because they're black. The data are just not there. Now, he couldn't function if he had a position in the NBA that was not backed by data and by facts. Watch how some other NBA people reacted to the death of George Floyd and the shooting of Jacob Blake. That's what I gotta wake up to, huh? That's what I gotta wake up to, huh? And why, why does it always have to get to a point where we see the guns firing. I know people get tired of hearing me say it, but we are scared as black people in America. Black men, black women, black kids, we are, we are terrified. Because you don't know. You have no idea. You have no idea how that cop that day left the house. You don't know if he walked on the good side of the bed. You don't know if he walked walk on, on the wrong side of the bed. You don't know if he had an argument at home with a significant other. You know, if one of his kids said something crazy to him and he left the house steaming. Or maybe he just left the house saying that today is going to be the end for one of these black people. What stands out to me is um, just just watching the Republican revenge, uh, convention and this they're spewing this fear, right? Like. All you hear Donald Trump and all of them talking about fear. We're the ones getting killed. We're the ones getting shot. Uh, we're the ones that we're denied 
to live in certain communities. Um, we've been hung, we've been shot, and all you do is keep hearing about fear. It's, it's amazing to me why we keep loving this country and this country does not love us back. I think I'm just embarrassed as a white person to know that that can happen, uh, to actually watch a lynching. You know, we've all seen books and you look in the books and you see black people hanging up on trees and you, you are amazed that we just saw it again. And about George Floyd, here's what Steve Kerr tweeted. This is murder. Disgusting. Seriously. What the hell is wrong with us? Okay. Okay. Where's your evidence? Where's your evidence for this assertion? This is disgusting. Why does this keep happening? It doesn't keep happening. In the last several years, about a thousand people have been killed by the police. Now, for perspective, 50 million interactions between police and civilian every year. That results in about 11 million arrests, over 60,000 officers assaulted. Despite all of that, quote, only, close quote, 1,000 people are killed by cops every year. Almost every single one of them was resisting with a weapon or resisting violently. When you get down to those who are unarmed, and even those who are unarmed and not posing a threat, because after all, Michael Brown was unarmed, but his DNA was found on the officer's gun. When you get down to those who are unarmed, but do not but who did not reasonably pose a threat, you're talking about less than 4% of all of the interactions that result in deaths. And again, that 4% does not necessarily mean not dangerous. Unarmed does not always mean not dangerous. You could be perceived falsely as being dangerous. So the question is, out of all the people that were killed by the police, how many of them were unarmed black people who were reasonably perceived not to be threatening? Again, well under 4%. Meanwhile, last weekend in Chicago, 55 people shot, 10 killed. Weekend before that, 66 people in Chicago, five killed. Where's Black Lives Matter on that? And again, of all the homicides in this country, almost half of them are black victims, almost all of them killed by other black people. The number one cause of preventable death for whites, young white men, accidents, like car accidents, or drownings. The number one cause of death, whether preventable or non-preventable, for young black men, homicide, almost always at the hands of another black male. Now, this notion about the police using deadly force against black people disproportionately, it was analyzed by a black economist named Roland Fryer from Harvard. And he said the findings were the most surprising of his career. Not only did he not find data that the police were using deadly force against blacks just because they were black, but he also found the police were more hesitant, more reluctant to pull the trigger on a black person than on a white person. So when it comes to these sports people in the NBA, people like Steve Kerr, people like Steven Jackson, people like LeBron James, where's the same mindset that skillfully analyzes their play when it comes to a, a, a game? When they sit down and they go over the stat sheet, they apply logic and facts and data. Why aren't they doing that when it comes to this issue? Why? I once had the privilege of being invited to a speech by Doc Rivers given at a local country club. And he talked about the upcoming season. And again, facts, logic, data, surgically precise, insightful. I was very impressed. But when it comes to that same man applying this to, when it comes to these alleged epidemic of police killing blacks just because they're blacks, what happened to that guy? Where did he go? As mentioned, these athletes could not function if they did not logically approach their own craft. Joe Torre was a former baseball player and a former manager with the New York Yankees. Listen to how he describes how he approaches managing. Take notes. If you want to help a player improve, you must be detailed in your review. Make notes about your practice plan so you can adjust skills and drills if necessary. Write down what you feel each player needs to work on. Take notes during games regarding which fundamentals the team needs to practice. And note the positive things that happen during games or practices and recognize those players. Do you think the great Peyton Manning approached the game emotionally 
without logic. Watch how he <laughs> explains why he uses the call Omaha. I don't, uh, yeah, I'm not sure I know how to answer that. Uh, I've had a lot of people ask what Omaha means, and uh, it's uh, Omaha is a, um, it's a run play that, but it could be a pass play <laughs> or a play action pass, depending on uh, a couple things, the wind, uh, which way we're going, uh, quarter, and uh, the jerseys that we're wearing. So it, it varies, uh, uh, really play to play. So uh, that's, uh, there's your answer to that one. So sports figures, a small request. We love watching you. We love watching you analyze your play. We love sports because you use logic and facts and data to make your argument. I ask you, approach any issue, particularly this issue of whether or not the police are killing blacks just because they're blacks, with the same kind of logic, fact, reason that you use for your own profession. In other words, I'm asking you to raise your game. Finally, one story. I went to a football game not long ago, and a buddy of mine also invited the former mayor of Los Angeles. His name is Antonio Villaraigosa. He's a Democrat. I didn't know he was coming. He didn't know I was coming. We're sitting side by side to each other. He gets up, he goes to the restroom. He comes back and he says, Larry, you're not going to believe what happened. You know they have these uh, automatic flush toilets at the stadium? I said, yeah. He said, I have a money clip, and I was using the restroom. A money clip went into the toilet, got flushed away. I said, did you have any money in the money clip? He said, yeah. I said, how much? He said, $300. I said, Antonio, I have two reactions to your story. The first is, if that happened to me, the last person I would tell is a radio talk show host. <laughs> and secondly, leave it to a left-wing Democrat to literally flush money down the toilet. <laughs> I'm Larry Elder, and we've got a country to save. I'll see you next time.